Dr. Richard Marshall has over 30 years of experience in the field of software design and innovation. He's been an entrepreneur, a Gartner analyst. He's the founder of Concept Gap. Lots of great things to read about him in his bio, so I would encourage you to do that later. For now, please listen to Building Digital Resilience. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we just had a little example of digital resilience there where my microphone stopped working and while I was sitting waiting, and we were able to fix that just dynamically. And one of the beautiful things about working in stage tech is that you're not supposed to let the audience see when something goes wrong, and the audience generally doesn't notice when everything's falling about the place. And that's actually a really important lesson for us in every aspect of resilience, is you should be able to respond dynamically to whatever is happening. Um, so I'm just checking the fonts because it's different on this monitor to that one, which is fine. Don't worry about it because this is the right font. Anyway, um, when I started working on this, I went back to my school days several million years ago amongst the dinosaurs. And uh, our school motto was never unprepared. And I've always liked that as a, a way of thinking about things, is you need to be ready for things that are going wrong or things that are going right and grasping that opportunity. And it's actually very important. And if you look at, uh, let's say, somebody like Bill Gates, who he attributes his success to, A, having had a lot of money to begin with, but B, grabbing the opportunity, is taking that opportunity, being ready for things that you might not necessarily have expected and go forwards. Anyway, so never unprepared. And the big problem we have at the moment is when we got there, the cupboard was bare. And that's why digital resilience comes up. And it was interesting listening to Andy talking. Uh, I had the question at the end there was, when do we reach peak IoT? And that led me to thinking about, well, well this good question is, where do we put all of the intelligence? And that needs chips, parts, whatever you want to call them, components. And that's just going to drive up the demand continuously. And if you can't get them, how do we drive this wonderful vision of the fully connected future? Because we can't actually build the damn things because we don't have the parts. So <clears throat> the supply chain behind everything we do is what we need to be thinking about. That's largely what I'm going to be talking about for the next 15 or so minutes. Um, so we, why is the cupboard bare? Well, this is actually a well-known economic effect called bullwhip. And the bullwhip works by the fact that you start with a little movement with one person, and there's a great big wave at the other end. So the, this is 1960s economic theory, which establishes that if one or two customers start to either vastly increase or vastly decrease demand for anything, the suppliers perceive this as a massive trend, and effectively they overreact, shall we say. So what we're seeing here is the results of bullwhip being applied to electronic components from a number of different areas. So there are ways of looking at this, and I'll come back to talking about that later. But I wanted to start off with what I believe is at the root of this, and this is a little bit political. The West, in general, has been driven into a mess by the fact that um, largely Thatcherism and Reaganism put this emphasis on money, finance, and they know the cost of everything and the value of nothing, and they're just moving money around. So uh, if I've offended anybody, that's fine. They can come and argue with me later. But what we really need to look at is actually understanding why we are thinking about accounting, reducing, cutting, da-da-da-da-da, because We've cut too much. You probably know Occam's razor, which is cut down to the minimum. Then there's a corollary to Occam's razor, which is but not beyond. And in many, many places, we have cut beyond where the minimum was. So we've gone beyond lean into skeletal, and it's failed. And this is because of this constant push to cut costs now at the expense of the future. So why did we get into this uh, fine mess? Um, so. I've split this out into external factors and internal factors, according to the industry. Um, external to the industry, internal to the industry. So while well, there was the pandemic drove a huge increase in the need for everything, and this is back to the 
supply chain. So it's not just people buying laptops. It's not just people buying new phones. It's also the servers behind that. It's the communication devices. It's buying routers and switches. It's buying air conditioning units for data centers. It's a huge demand all the way back. So can you imagine how many new servers Zoom must have had to buy in 2020? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't bear thinking about the, the number of servers that are out there. Um, I wish I had my glasses on. <laughs> I took them off so they didn't bang. Um, now, the interesting thing is that people have been saying that the supply of chips has been impacted because the factories were impacted by, the foundries were impacted by pandemic and staff loss. That's not actually true. If you, even the Chinese fabs were operating at 100% capacity throughout the pandemic, but what was impacted by coronavirus was the supply chain. We couldn't move things around. And I really am going to have to get my... Oh, I could look up here and read that one. Um, but that, those are two things that came out the blue. And I was talking about being ready. We should have had plans. Now, one of the things I've ended up doing over the years is business continuity and uh, disaster recovery for big IT systems. And um, there's a lot of interesting lessons in there, is that people have got comfortable with where we are and haven't really thought about, well, what if it all goes horribly wrong? Um, there are some things that we do know about that aren't ever going to go away. So war, piracy, affect shipping, that uh, containers disappear off trains, uh, boxes fall off ships into the sea, uh, pirates take ships. There's all sorts of reasons why the stuff that you have ordered at one point may not actually turn up where you need it. Um, as I say, sorry, I have to, have to look backwards to read because I haven't got my glasses on. Um, but there's another interesting aspect that uh, I'm going to jump over some of the samey things here. We are changing the way that we execute stuff. And whether it's uh, these nice uh, glowing devices or whether it is things like the pictures I'm using in this presentation, which we had one at the beginning, further in, they're generated by an AI. And those AIs are using GPUs. They're using specialized computing components. So we're seeing an evolution of the way that we compute, which is changing the demand for parts at all levels. So we're seeing increasing specialization. It's not like we can all put in uh, 741s and other, or TTL chips like we used to be able to do. And finally, the nature of workload is changing. So the things that we actually execute on all our digital devices has fundamentally changed. I started building mobile apps in 2004 when nobody had ever heard of them. And I was told, nobody's ever going to sit in an audience looking at their phone. <laughs> OK, literally. Um, the other thing was we demoed a social media platform to Facebook on, our, on phones that posted stuff using screen scraping. And they said, oh, we don't really see people posting um, status updates and photos from their phones. Actual quote. Now, internal stuff. Uh, I've talked a bit about bullwhip. Um, I don't think the supply chain management is very uh, has been perhaps as mature as it could be. Um, I think that there could have been more work done in there. It's easy for me to say. Car industry in particular, the fact that the car industry has moved from being a big mechanical thing into a data center on wheels has completely changed the demand profile over the years. So that's kind of interesting. But there's another aspect. When I was working on CAD software a long, long time ago for chip design, the thing was, oh, second source, second source, second source. Where can we get it from? Who's the alternative? And um, actually, the building across the road was a huge fab that built second source and nothing else. Um, because of the complexity of the chips that we're looking at building, there's only two suppliers that actually can make them anymore. And they are, therefore, restricted. And if one of them has problems, then the whole industry is affected. And, or if both of them, even worse, then we're, you know, we're all stuffed. So this is interesting that we've actually seen globalization not increasing the variety of uh, suppliers, but reducing it, which is not what it was supposed to do. The next thing is that if you're actually going to go and build a fab, it is billion dollar investment. It is a huge thing. You don't make that decision overnight. And if you think about this bullwhip effect, you want to minimize the number of things you build just because one customer, let's say you know, Toyota or Tesla or whoever decides they're going to buy a whole pile of new chips. But what's actually happened is that the skills level required to build and operate 
nanometer fabs aren't there anymore. People are retiring. <coughs> Kids are not coming into this because it's, they've not been brought in by the industry. And I think this is a function that we can absolutely do here. Uh, probably a lot of people from universities here. Manufacturing and these incredible technologies are not attracting the people that they should be. So we actually have a lack of skills of understanding of the incredible technology that goes into building uh, a nanometer fab or indeed any kind of silicon fab. I remember getting dressed up in the bunny suit going through the airlocks into the fab and thinking, how on earth can anybody do this on a regular basis? But they do. So we need to put more emphasis on building these skills so that we can build the industry around it. And that's something that's going to take a long time, but we're going to need to do it before the apocalypse in, 19, in 2038. Um, the other thing is, mentioned this already, we're very reliant on long supply chains. And those supply chains are opaque. If you buy something, we have no idea how it got to us. And that's something that is, if, can impact you instantly. And part of the risk assessment and understanding that is that you need to know where the weak points are in your supply chain, even if it's not your supply chain. You might just phone up Radio Spares and ask them to send you something. But how did it get to them? How did it get to us? Minor incident, my younger daughter has just started a job in Berlin, and she was shipping her effects in three boxes. The company shipping them went bust. Nobody knew where the boxes were for any of the people being shipped by this company. They've actually found them now, now the exercise is to figure out how to get them out of the storage that they're in into the place. So your supply chain is instantly vulnerable. And finally, the emphasis continue accounting emphasis on lean has been problematic. There is nothing in the store cupboard. And what's interesting is uh, this is Edwards Deming who invented lean and very bright guy, very good idea. But what's really interesting well, he died in 1993, so I made up this quote. He didn't actually say that, so I'm just going to be clear about that. Um, Toyota, actually, are, who were the inventors of lean manufacturing and uh, just in time and all the rest of it, they had the experience with the earthquake and the resulting tsunami and the nuclear disaster in Japan. They actually had to fatten up their supply chains because they had the practical experience and they learned we can't just survive and relying on those trucks rolling in all the time. Um, and I'm sure that if he was alive today, Mr. Deming would definitely be saying that. Now, interestingly, Mr. Deming, um, wait a minute, there's a slide thing. that jumped. No, it's the same on both. Oh, well, never mind. Um, what is resilience? So, I was going to lead on to why, but we'll come to why in a minute. Right, so what is resilience? Um, so, Let's have a look at some definitions of it. This is another one of those AI-generated pictures, by the way. I just gave it three or four words about supply chain and resilience, and it came up with this uh, amazing picture in the background. I hate to think how much energy it used to do it, but it, it made a nice picture. Um, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. That's what the Oxford English Dictionary defines resilience to be. I think that's a pretty good definition, and this is matching the never unprepared things. So you expect stuff to go wrong. Cross your bridges before you get to them. And, uh, and the link I was going to make with Deming is that uh, Simon Sinek is best known for asking why. The classic toddler question, qua classic requirements management question. Why do you want to do that? And five why, something else that came from Deming. Toyota, absolutely brilliant mechanism. Why do you want to do this? Why is it? Why are we buying things that are manufactured in you know, 5,000 miles away? Anyway, Sinek actually recently said, resilience is not stability, it's about adapting, agility, the ability to respond. And I thought that was actually a really, really good definition of it. It's about this notion, uh, we think of resilience meaning that we're a stable, ongoing, reliable thing, but that's not actually what it's about. Reliable structures very often end up being the most fragile, not stable structures end up being the most fragile. So, as we move on, let's look at it. So what do, how do I define it? Well, I think that resilience, from my point of view, is the ability to respond quickly to events and to be able to make decisions quickly. So it's not wringing our hands and going, oh, no, no, what are we going to do? It's a disaster. How, how can we possibly get out of this? It's about coming in. And one of the key things here is it's better to make the wrong decision quickly than not make a decision at all or to make the right decision but too late. So we need to drive into this decision-making process. We really have to 
be, to be resilient, we have to be observing and planning, expecting things to go wrong. And that's where I go back to business continuity. Um, I'm going to take up from one of the things that Andy said uh, before the break as well, which was security is coming in version two. Um, that's not good enough. <laughs> you need to come in there early, and that's a beautiful example of non-optimal. You need to check things like that, because if you're going to end up with a problem with security in a device, you could take down the entire chain of things, because we're all connected together. Um, planning um, disaster recovery is all about that planning process, is what could possibly go wrong, brainstorming, hazards, things, weaknesses across the whole organization, which leads us really into that risk assessment. And then adequate redundancy. Adequate varies from who you are, so you can't just say you need a lot of stuff you have an interesting world to look into. How do we ensure that fall over, failover? Again, big software thing is failover. How do we apply that to our supply chain? I want to move on to thinking about how can we do this across a whole range? So we've got personal, uh, company, industry, national, and government levels. Um, one of the examples that I like to use is for personal is if you have people working from home. Now, I've been working from home for 15 years or more. In fact, I first worked from home in the 1980s with a dial-up modem and an 80 by 24 character cell terminal. Um, how many people remember 80 by 24 green screen terminals? Yeah, a few. <laughs> We're dying out. Um, but what happens if you are in the middle of delivering a webinar, which I do occasionally, and your internet connectivity drops out, if your power drops out and takes the internet with it? Well, the answer is that I have phones which are already sitting there waiting for uh, to go on to uh, being a Wi-Fi hub on the phone because the likelihood of the cellular coverage going out is actually quite low uh, because they've got battery backups in the stations and yada, 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 because they, they worry about these things. If the power goes out, I'm using a laptop, so it's got a battery with eight hours life in it hopefully. So I can keep going. Now, if you've got people working from home, which I think absolutely working from home is what everybody should be doing unless they need to actively be engaging in an office, they will have to be faced with their network dropping out, power failures, all this kind of stuff, things that go naturally wrong. Um, a lot of my American friends have generators because their power is so unreliable, for example. So this is about personal resilience. But anyway, let's have a look at what can my organization do? Well, as a software guy, really, um, agile. If we can't get this part, can we use that part? I don't know how difficult that is to do with modern technology, but it's to do with resilience within your design to ensure that you can at least consider alternative ways of doing things quickly. Clearly, there's manufacturing issues, and it's easy for me to say, but it's a way of thinking rather than an actual method. The other thing. Agile procurement, if you can't get it from this person, can we get it from somebody else? Being ready to know who you can get things from, even if you're not actually in there. Now, stockpiling if you can, that's, that is one of the things that causes that bullwhip, but it's interesting. If you can do it, then it actually has benefits for yourself, selfish benefits, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Service now, in March of this year, noticed that the delivery time for the servers for their cloud infrastructure, because they run their own hosting, they couldn't get the servers in less than 40, 45 days normal delivery, and it was pushing out to 120. ServiceNow has got big, deep pockets, so they just said, we're going to buy the whole year's worth of kit in one go, boom. And of course, the supplier goes, this is great. I love it. So they go, jump to the head of the queue, and they have servers to keep them going for the rest of the year. Um, modeling your supply chains. I mean. A lot of really cool modeling tools out there, but even understanding, I go back to uh, where do you get your supplies from, where do they get their supplies from, and onwards down the chain. You need to understand that, understand the risk, and then you can also look at branches, because if somebody, like, I'll go back to radio spares, because that's how, what I grew up with, uh, RS components get theirs from somebody else, and maybe you go to Farnell if RS can't get them, because it's all coming there. So it's all connected, we're all graph connected, as we know. Um, how can we shorten supply chains? How can we try and get stuff more locally? Now, that's obviously very difficult if we're talking about uh, GPUs or something like that, but it's something to think about. And other mechanisms. Now, this obviously doesn't apply to chips, but in software, 
you're not going to be able to get Dell to ship you servers any more quickly, so move everything into the cloud as a, as a, as a model. Make it somebody else's problem, because Microsoft isn't going to take no for an answer from Dell, but they'll happily say no to you as a small company. Um, no one solution, nothing easy. It's all difficult. I'm not trying to underestimate the complexity. So what can we do as an industry? Don't panic. So much, anyway. All right. The standard routine of you panic quickly, gets the adrenaline flowing, and then you focus on things. Use statistical models to understand this bullwhip thing. There's well-defined statistical approaches that will tell you whether a demand change is anomalous or not. We have lots of AI tools out there that help you do that. Um, can we bring design and manufacturing closer to home, please? Bring back the valuable jobs, try and get them slightly more local. Um, understanding all of these complicated trade patterns. So we're, we've been talking, about, or I've been talking about chips, but if you're going to have chips, you need to have wafers. If you're going to have wafers, you need to have sand. And it turns out that the sand that's used to make the wafers in Taiwan comes from China, and then the chips go back to China where they manufacture the servers. So this is a very, very complicated, interwoven, and not very well understood world that we have. It's a graph. Um, that first slide the AI generated for me actually has this graph over the world on it, connectivity. And I'm going to say it again, we need to build more skills. Um, census, obviously, heavily driving that. Uh, we're also seeing people like Scotland is driving education in technology. We need to have more people coming in, but I think we need to start moving in a slightly different direction. Now, this is something that Census proposed in 2021. Their technical director suggested that there should be a cooperative of all of the organizations to pool the purchasing power. That's what the co-op did all those years ago when the first co-op started. Moving away from the company store, let's go together. We've got bigger buying power. Um, that cooperative can do lots of different things. It can help understand what cooperation means between potential competitors. It can help you pull parts. Um, one of the problems with the bullwhip thing is there are people out there who have too much stock and people who have got none. Fairly standard economic modeling again, working together where you can pull the inventory. It's very easy to do that sort of stuff with the web nowadays. It doesn't require a huge investment to do that. And we can create centers of excellence that can pick up on ideas of problems, identify it, and work together so that even if you're competitors, you can work with your competitors to understand how to solve these industry-level problems, national-level problems, and of course, we can educate the government. Anybody here from Scottish government? <laughs> well, that tells you something already. Right, actually, the... Uh, the tech people are pretty damn good in the Scottish government, so they, it's a pity they're not here. Anyway, um, so what can governments do? Well, they can understand what we're talking about, because most of them wouldn't have a clue. Um, <laughs> that's sad but true. If you go into doing politics, you go and study history or Latin or something deeply relevant to running a, a digital economy. Um, they also have to have something related to understanding that digital is a national security issue. I think we might finally have got there. Finally, sort of, maybe. Anyway, we need to be able to build this stuff because uh, defense mechanisms, economic survival, blah, blah, blah. And economy is, let's face it, where war happens nowadays, even if uh, poor people are being blown up at the moment. Um, the economy, digital is where all of this comes back and focuses. We need to increase local investment in manufacturing. It's not dirty. It's a lot cleaner than finance, that's for sure. Um, we need to stop selling off our assets. I don't think anybody here is going to argue with that one. Uh, we need to build more, blah, blah, blah. So I put at the bottom, make manufacturing great again, because it's not, I think everybody thinks of manufacturing as people with big spanners and covered in greasy overalls. We all know that's not the case. It's incredibly high value stuff and it's working now, but we need to make that shift from thinking that manufacturing is something that somebody else does through to thinking that this is high value stuff that we do. Um, so what can governments do? Well, governments are already doing quite a lot around the world. There's the EU European Chips Act that is investing in local technology building. The, the Chips Act in the US, that's very well known, uh, giving lots of money to people who've already got lots of money to build fabs back in the US, so people like Intel. And guess what? <laughs> 
they can't get the staff to run the fabs. So they can buy the equipment, they can build the buildings, but they don't have the people. Because all that expertise is in the Far East. Um, uh, tip four, international action between those four countries. And this is that web of supply chain and the complexity that we're looking at there. South Korea and Japan both have their internal programs. All these countries actually have had a lot of experience because of the tsunamis and earthquakes and in Japan, the nuclear disaster, as I was talking about earlier. So they're actually well aware of the risks. So they're working on it now. Um, and finally, how are we going to do this? Three things, three steps. Uh, first one is prepare for the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. Not very helpful, but you know what I mean. Be agile, be flexible. Don't just try doing the same thing. Um, and that's, that is a problem because a lot of cultural aspects to do with manufacturing is to do with predictability and we're always going to make the same thing. So agility may not come naturally. And finally, as an industry, as a nation, we have to come together, work together and support each other. So thank you.